Good, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's great to be here with you. Um, and it's my privilege to um, introduce the book panel. So um, the book panel today is going to be looking at um, a new publication that's coming out with SEM Press this fall. Um, it's called Ecclesiology for a Digital Church. And um, I'm going to start by giving you a few, um, a little bit of background to this book, and then um, in briefly introducing each of our um, speakers, um, contributors to the book, and then turn it over to them. Um, but uh, this book began and was born out of the COVID experience. Um, like many of you, um, you know, I was in lockdown for a large portion of the time. And um, uh, I, I was able to do a couple of book projects um, during that time, um, eBooks. And um, uh, the first book, um, uh, the Distance Church had such a good reception. It was a combination of pastors and then um, scholars commenting on how their research or how their experience was about religion and technology was changing. Um, it um, was really very well received as we've had over um, 23,000 downloads of the book so far. Um, but a lot of theological issues were raised in that book that came out in um, April, May, 2020. And so um, I decided to kind of um, uh, wanted to kind of birth a conversation out of the that that um, those questions that were being raised, and so I sent emails out to a lot of my theologian friends and said, "Hey, would you be willing to contribute to an ebook um, on digital ecclesiology and just looking at these issues?" Um, and so many of my um, friends answered that call that it ended up that we were able to do both an ebook and what we're now launching as um, the, a traditional hardcover, um, traditional book. Um, so the ebook Digital Ecclesiology came out last August and was kind of again, a first step in kind of defining what a digital ecclesiology would look like, especially for churches that are negotiating from moving from offline to online. And um, the ecclesiology for digital church is kind of trying to look at um, our future that will be more hybrid, that will not just be in the um, offline online context. And so um, I'm pleased today to be able to introduce um, some of our speakers for that. Um, and just to let the speakers know that um, you, um, uh, we all have access to sharing slides. So you're able to share slides if you do have them for your presentation. The aim is for each of them to talk five, no more than seven minutes. And so that we can have some time for discussion as well. And thanks Jonas for putting the a link to um, that, that ebook up on the screen as well. So um, today we're gonna, um, this, this book is co-edited with um, uh, John Dyer um, of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he's gonna be starting us out speaking on um, exploring the concept of ecclesia, ecclesia or ecclesiology and what that means in the digital era. Um, we're then gonna be moving on to uh, Kwabna Asmo Gadio um, from Trinity Theological Seminary in Ghana. And he's gonna be looking at um, lockdown and the church, especially in the Ghanaian and African contests context and looking at especially African Pentecostals responded to the pandemic. We'll then move on to Kate Ott, who's going to be looking at interesting topics related to children and creativity and te digital technologies. Um, then Thomas Schlag um, and Sabrina Mueller um, are going to be speaking about the concept of religious influencers. And influencers are in the German sense, not in what they might translate in English sense, and going to be talking about how um, religious experiences in the church can create a new participatory culture. And then finally, um, uh, our Jonas Karlberg from University of Durham, he is going to um, be wrapping us up speaking about new worship patterns and thinking about liturgical issues in the in ecclesiology for a digital church. So again, I want to thank you for everyone who answered my call and is part of this book project that we're um, not able to present today. And I look forward to hearing myself, um, people's uh, responses and um, conversations about the, this new publication. So I'll turn it over now to John. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, some slides here just to let you see the entire set of contributors. Um, the, the chapters in this book are fantastic, and Heidi put together a really great group of scholars and thinkers. And um, so I encourage you to get, get the whole book and be able to read all of these. But the sampling today is also a great set. So um, I, I end up, after our introduction, getting the first chapter in this book, and uh, part of this is just to explore some of the ways that, that we've used the term ecclesia um, and the, the ways that you see it, really in the popular level, the way the discussions happened. And so if you, if you remember back to those sort of early days of online church, maybe in the early 2000s, there was all the questions about, is church real? Is online church real? What about embodiment? 
And we've used these terms with a lot of precision as, as theologians and as digital religion researchers. But if you think back to those moments in the early pandemic, we have these images in our mind, right, of, of what was happening and different expressions of church and different ways that people were experiencing it and all the funny things that happened in those first few weeks and moments. But what was really in, in interesting me in some way was as I looked online and I noticed the way people were using terms, terms like virtual, terms like digital, terms like online, uh, these were all being used sort of interchangeably in a lot of different ways. And so it was sometimes difficult to know exactly what someone meant and what type of experience they were either having or critiquing. And so one of the ones that really stood out to me was this this from the, the Church of England, where they use virtual, recorded, watch, online, almost every single possible term all in the same moment. And if you remember, this was just about two weeks before um, or two weeks after after lockdown within about 10 days. And so, you know, there's a lot of imprecision here. And, and as digital religion researchers, we always want to start to have some precision here so that we can tell the difference between Zoom church and virtual reality church. And as the time went on, you know, you can go through these and you can see that there were people uh, beginning to use terms like virtual and pejorative ways. So in this first one, someone is saying, you know, virtual is this bad thing that's actually been happening for a long time. So in the chapter that I'm, that I'm working on, I, I wanted to sort of bring all these vocabulary together just so that the average pastor or church reader could come in and say, how do these all work together? And so what the chapter is attempting to do is just to say, let's propose some vocabulary that, that clarifies some of the technology being used and then map those to some of the theological terms and then to just sort of propose that really this technology, technological linking between local and universal churches has been going on for some time. So just as a, as a brief overview of some of the terms, um, I know that, that online church is used in this very broad way as a catch-all term, but then trying to sort of encourage some ways of thinking about the, the primary way that most churches went, which was one way, and to link that back to the whole 20th century conversation about broadcast church from radio and television. And then looking at more interactive forms and trying to differentiate those. And then when we use the term virtual, really throughout the book, uh, we don't use virtual uh, unless it's using it really for, for VR environments to allow that to be a unique form of church that sort of looks at spatial senses and, and hearing and the way that we interact in a much different way than you and I are today in, in, a, in a Zoom session, which is a more interactive way. And that, that then allows us to then uh, have words like hybrid church that look at more um, in-person and online happening simultaneously, where there might be groups of people connecting. And then we sort of go through the, the scripture, and, and you all know these things, that there are several places where different authors will use the term uh, church or, or ecclesia to mean something like a, a local body. And then sometimes they'll use it in a more theological sense to mean all the people whom God has gathered. So what this allows us to do is then just to map all of these terms all in one place and then be, begin discussion. what do these different modalities do? How do they connect us to, to each other? What kinds of connections do we see between God and humanity? And then to make this basic argument that, that one of the things that is, is often talked about is that the 90 minutes of, on Sundays, that's where real embodiment happens. That's the good stuff, right? But there's this whole moment in between uh, the, these six days or these 365 days of the pandemic where what is it that we're doing? And, and really the argument is that since the beginning of the church that we've been using letters and all kinds of technology to connect the local church and sort of this broad uh, universal church. So this has been happening for a long time. And so if the church is the extension of God into the world, that the local church is just one of those things and that all of these other expressions end up being valid as well. So that's some of the things that we cover in, in that chapter, but I wanna turn it over to uh, some of my other uh, more accomplished speakers because they have some other great things to say. So thank you very much. All right, next up is Kwapna. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kwapna Asamwajedu from Ghana, although this morning I'm speaking to you from Atlanta. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, John and Heidi for getting me involved in this work. It, helped me to reflect on what was going on around me at the height of the pandemic. And suddenly um, we found ourselves uh, in lockdown mode um, and our lives were also restricted. I am president of a seminary and suddenly I had to close the seminary um, and uh, the students had to go home. And so um, we had to find things to do. 
So I'd like to thank them for getting me involved in this. I have just five minutes, so I'm going to just raise with you some of the issues that you would find in my chapter. The title is Locked Down, but not Locked Out. Locked Down because we couldn't be in church physically, but we're not locked out. And it seemed to me that for Pentecostals in particular, the pandemic brought quite a bit of confusion, especially when we are talking about contemporary Pentecostalism with its theological emphasis on positives and possibilities and prosperity. And suddenly, whether you were a general overseer or pastor or whoever, uh, the virus had forced you to change uh, course, uh, to change the way you do things and so on. So this raised for us issues of mental health, loneliness, the desire for fellowship. One of the things that was very striking for me was how suddenly Holy Communion had to be celebrated online. And it brought out of the Pentecostal leaders a certain spirit of innovation. They had to come to terms with the, the reality of, of the times. And I'd like to read for you just a paragraph of something that one of the most popular Pentecostal leaders said when he had to move his services online. Um, there was a, a short press conference, and this is what he said. Well, praise the Lord, as you know, our world in the last few months has experienced some interesting times and will live in a very interesting time. One moment, everything seems to be peaceful and all of a sudden, everything seems to be tumbling. Um, stock exchanges are collapsing. Economies are tottering. Factories are closing down. Offices are shutting down. And now church has to be done online and through broadcasts. So we are taking our church services into a new dimension. And who knows, it may reach more people for, the, for Christ than we're doing at first. So beginning from Sunday, our services will be primarily online through our church app, my ICGC app, and so on and so on. ICGC is a national uh, central uh, gospel church. And interestingly, this pastor then goes on to say that going virtual does not undermine our reverence for God. In other words, there's a certain kind of um, a change of worldview from the fact that we, we are used to meeting in person or if you like a, a physical, but now it is the virtual versus the reality. And therefore the minds of uh, church members um, had to be prepared in order to be able to accommodate this new way of doing things. But in this chapter, um, the thing that I'd like to focus on uh, because of the time, is the fact that the health and wealth gospel or the gospel of prosperity, as I say in my chapter, seem to have come unstuck. Because for years, people have been made to believe that the ecclesia, the body of Christ, has to be made up of people who are flourishing a certain way in health, in wealth, in well-being. And then suddenly, um, this virus indiscriminately affects everyone, including livelihoods. And so suddenly, I found pastors who for a very long time had not preached on anything that you can call repentance or judgment or the second coming of Christ suddenly move gradually away from prosperity into those kinds of themes. It was very striking because I work on Pentecostalism and these are pastors I listen to all the time. So that's the first thing. Then the second one was how the virus itself was problematized in terms of evil for the church. Because in Africa, we live in a context in which supernatural evil is hyperactive. So suddenly you had to find a way to explain um, the presence of a virus that has affected everybody's life 
including that of the pastor. And so some blamed it on witchcraft, some gave, uh, 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 referred to it as a principality and power and so on. So suddenly the discourse in the church moved away from the usual health and wealth. And if I may relate this to uh, Holy Communion as I finish, is that then the virtual Holy Communion became the means by which you deal with the virus. So as the pastor prayed over the element, he said, um, may, may this, this, these elements of bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ deal with any uh, virus that will attack you and things like that. So the whole discourse even around Holy Communion uh, seemed to have changed. And so I, I think that um, the virus has, as it were, uh, changed our understanding of what it means to be church uh, within the Pentecostal context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwabna. And now Kate is going to talk to us about new um, um, ways of um, doing church, especially with youth. Thanks. Um, I just want, Kwabena, I thought your note of it incited a spirit of innovation, I think captures exactly what this, this text and the online text um, offers all of us. And so I, um, a lot of my work is on children and youth. Um, so I wanna, you know, thank Heidi and John for bringing this together and inviting me to be part of it. Also, um, Jonas and Kyle for putting the whole conference together. Uh, it's been amazing conversations thus far. So I really appreciate that. Um, so like many, you know, I think COVID hit and our churches all scrambled to figure out what to do and what to do with children during this time. Um, many folks created separate programs for them as we usually do, at least in the US context. Um, and I wanted to play with that in the sense that um, Joyce Ann Mercer, who's a practical theologian, calls that liturgical apartheid. She feels like the movement of many of us to segment off children and youth ministries into things that will entertain them um, perpetuates a consumerist culture in our ecclesiological practices. Uh, so the very first thing that inspired me was actually an analog text, um, which is called God Goes to Church by Edwina Gately. And um, she imagined, I read this to Sunday school classes every year, usually the younger kids and even the older kids love it because God goes to all these different churches and in every church, God finds these ways that people are excluded. Um, and, and Edwina Gately's proposing that God wants to find a church where everyone can participate given their own gifts and needs. And this just happened to be a really great pandemic idea, which was a church that happens in a park. Now, of course, we'd have to change some of the ideas around sharing food and washing hands and things. But it got me thinking about how those ways are similar as we think about church as it happened during COVID for children. Um, so one of the things in this text that I try to do is lean into what we call childist theologies. So theologies that center children and children's experiences. And so for that, you can tell from the title, I went directly to um, Jesus's sort of gospel text that we usually use where Jesus welcomes the children, but I didn't focus on the welcoming of the children. I focused on the command to do not stop them. Um, so the command back to us as adults to decenter our adult perspective and put children center and, and first. And um, Mercer and some other um, biblical theologians who focus on children, mostly in the New Testament, talk about the idea that the gospels give us ideas of how we are supposed to do this already. And focusing on Mark's gospel, I talk about the ways in which um, we get clues for how to treat children in our ecclesiological practices. And the first is that children have a purpose. They're not these carefree gifts or some trope of reproductive futurism or these innocent things that we're supposed to protect. They have a purpose. And that purpose is right now, they are already part of Jesus's ministry. Jesus calls them into ministry. Jesus doesn't say, oh, wait, wait till you're 13 or 18 until we can confirm you or something like that. They're immediate and already part of that ministry. Um, 
Also, it's another call in Mark's gospel to Jesus pointing out those who are the least among us and children, especially in the biblical context and time period, are least in the sense of being property, um, often forced into particular kinds of labor to keep family or village going. So this isn't like the cute, dressed up, clean little kids that come to Sunday school in our context. Um, these are these are real life kids who have struggles who Jesus is putting at the center of this ministry call. Um, and for me, that also then relates to a liberative call in terms of bringing those from the margins into the center as we do our work. So as I think about children and worship, um, one of the things that I find most often in my context is that we are trying to tamp down them being children right? We want them to sit still. We want them to face forward. We want them to say what we say. We want them to sing what we sing. We don't want them to ask questions. And instead, my suggestion is we invite children's affective queerness or their social and non-normativity um, and find ways that that expression and behaviors can challenge our disciplining normative adult-centric ways. Of, of being church that often recreate the kind of oppressive social systems that we're already in. Um, so Jesus follows his permission to the children with a reprimand to the adults of do not stop them. And I think Jesus' embrace of children in this passage and others advances a new social order that we are supposed to be paying attention to. So this is both ecclesiological and eschatological. Um, and in this sense, I think that happened somewhat in our digital spaces during COVID. Children's subjectivities reinforce this need for creative, relational, and interdependent ways of being church. And that was mirrored, I felt, in the networked, diverse, and responsive nature of digital technology as folks were trying to experiment with doing church during COVID. Some caveats. When I say doing church during COVID, I definitely mean what John's talking about in terms of either the broadcast or um, the interactive modes. And yet it's also hybrid, because if you're thinking of children who are participating or watching in any way, there's almost always other folks with them, right? So in that sense, it embodies both this online and offline integration of ecclesiology. Um, so in the chapter, I suggest that a childless digital ecclesiology, it's not utopic by any means, um, but the key to it is being child-centric and leveraging the affordances of digital technology in well-informed ways, also critiquing issues of disparity and discrimination in design practices. But what it might afford us is the opportunity to lift the restrictions of time and geographic location. I don't know about any of you, but sometimes it's difficult to get kids in one spot for one hour all the time or four hours, whatever your church time period is, right? This opens that up to you know the ways in which they can attend when, when it works for them in their schedule, in a family schedule, in a parenting schedule. Um, it affords room for differences in physical and cognitive abilities. You know, if, if you're participating in church online, you can jump off your sofa, you can move, you can dance, you can yell, you can wiggle, you can ask questions because you're on mute, um, right? You could choose to only listen to the music. If that's the thing that draws you closer to God, you can walk away during the sermon, right? You can focus on an object in the background. So it, it, it has a much more diverse kind of engagement that's possible, especially for children's affectivities. It also invites relationality and co-creation. Um, and in that sense, I think the audio, visual and textual communications allow for a mediated engagement across broadcast interactive and um, these hybrid ways of engaging. So I'll just finish with, with um, my sort of final thesis, which is a one size fits all experience of in-person worship, regardless of the community's dominant form, um, needs to be transitioned. And we can transition that into a diverse, more networked way of worshiping together. And so an ecclesiology of do not stop them should be committed to practices that unleash creative childish sensibilities with their, with their affinity to digital technologies, which hopefully will create new spaces of welcome and liberation. 
Thank you, Kate. Uh, I, I love that do not stop them phrase. It has really stuck with me. So I, I absolutely love that. Um, well, Thompson and Sabrina are up next to talk about Sinfluencers, and this will be an, an exciting talk. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to do so. First of all, Heidi and John, very, very many thanks for inviting us to, to contribute to that fascinating publication. Um, if it is fine for you, I will share my screen for, for the, the minutes I have. Um, you've heard from Heidi the title uh, already, so I do not have to repeat that. Uh, Sabrina won't be with us today, but she will be with us tomorrow for our uh, broader presentation. So what, what are we doing in this book chapter? We ask and explore, um, and Heidi mentioned it already, the so-called term sinfluences. And again, that has nothing to do with sin in, in, in the English or American meaning. It is about religious meaning. And there is a, a certain group of so-called influences coming um, on the map of uh, uh, digital communication within at least the German speaking context. So what do they do? They offer space. First of all, we heard about that earlier today. And that's space for mutual religious experiences. And they also encourage and empower their followers. And we did uh, an empir a first empirical study about that. Uh, I will show you a little bit, give you some insights in a second. And the idea is actually that the followers, followers themselves become theologically and hermeneutically active and productive. And this especially in times of the crisis. So uh, I hope you do not feel irritated by these images, but this is just an impression. So they, these influences, they just, they explicitly present themselves as influences in the theological and or the digital church context, or maybe the virtual, or maybe the global church context to connect to John. Um, and their aim is to enter into meaningful religious discourses with the people, with their followers. And it's actually thousands of followers, uh, quite high numbers, up to 20, 30,000 people following these, um, these influences, influences. And as I said, they do not only share their own experiences and living conditions, but they also create space for individual meaningful theological expression of fear, hope, and faith, with, which is uh, especially true for, as I said, times of the crisis. They use, which is not surprising, a variety of social media, and they are pre present in manifold N, reciprocal, or you could also call it resonant ways or relational ways anyway. Um, and the interesting thing is that they themselves uh, do or have a, some kind of a, of a hybrid appearance. They are official and uh, all of them church employed uh, people and also private persons in, and it's obviously intended that they show um, some or high authenticity and authority in a new sense. Heidi speaks of the digital strategists at one point in her, in her book. So this is actually true for them as well. So they navigate between institutional and media contexts and establish new blended space, uh, spaces of influence and interaction. And just to give you a one very brief insight and impression. So we looked into the, the, the dialogues or the resonances during the crisis. Uh, and what they do, these influences, then they do not only use their own theological dogmatic expertise, but they themselves ask questions. And this is just one of the questions in the very early uh, stage of the pandemic. Uh, they asked, one of them asked, do you think God and Corona have anything to do with each other? I would like to know your answer to that question. That was one of these female pastors you see on the right hand side. And they received a lot of reactions and answers. And one of that was, and we, we uh, looked in, into the answers more, more in, in depth, but just one, God once made a promise in the Old Testament to never again destroy all mankind with rainbow as a sign of this. This alone speaks against an unintended punishment. So. Uh, you see here is a lot of conversation going on between the so-called professionals and the uh, laic followers. And that's most interesting. Now, in terms of the, the ecclesiological reflection, we find very helpful the orientation uh, with and to Paul Tillich. So just two uh, quotes, uh, we go about, we have more about that in, in our chapter, of course. Um, uh, Tillich uh, quote, quote, the spiritual community contains an indefinite variety of expressions of faith and does not exclude any of them. 
It is open in all directions because it is based on the central manifestation of the spiritual presence. So you could call this resonance space also a spiritual space and a spiritual presence. We heard that also from the colleagues from New Zealand, which I find very interesting. And a second quote, the divine life participates in every life as its ground and aim. God participates in everything that is. He has community with it. He shares in his destiny. You could also say digital theology erases the question of uh, theology of and about God, of course, and Tillich we find here very helpful. Final slide, some conclusions and perspectives. The multidimensionality of proclamation and the possibility to respond, as we can see in the St. Francis channels, shaped by digital formats, creates a resonant space of communal theologizing. Synfluences open their own theological interpretation to other theolo theology productive practices. So uh, for the normal practice in pastoral everyday, if there is a normal practice in pastoral everyday life, one has to learn from those theologically productive, charismatic and passionate influences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. That was a great overview of your of your um, chapter. Uh, last but certainly not least is Jonas. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Heidi and John, for allowing me to be part of this great volume. I look forward to seeing the 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 book itself, and I'll certainly be using some of the chapters in 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 my classes. Um, so one of the things that interested me uh, when churches around the world started using online um, and digital platforms for services due to the pandemic um, was how they were developing uh, digital liturgical practices. Uh, many churches, they started just simply by broadcasting or replicating their normal services, um, and some were a little bit more innovative uh, with time. Uh, but this chapter is an attempt uh, to provide a framework to assist churches uh, as they negotiate these new liturgical practices um, and really um, how to use uh, this technology liturgically. So the basic premise of the chapter is that worship is inevitably mediated and this is since media technology is an inescapable feature of worship and whether this be church buildings, hymn books, stained glass windows, organs, speaker systems, video projectors, or even language. Such liturgical objects serve to draw the worshippers into an encounter with the divine. And yesterday we were speaking a bit at conference about how digital culture provides new metaphors and concepts for theologians and it allows us to see our faith, faith in a new light. So given that liturgy is mediated practices and that liturgical objects are media technology that serve to direct the worshippers attention and desires, I here explore the thesis that liturgy could be understood as a form of persuasive technology. As design mechanisms that seek to sway individuals' behaviors and thought, persuasive technology is widely applied through digital means. And it today has been used to in a broad range of areas from healthcare to education, safety, environment, protection, self-motivation and politics. It can, for instance, encourage individuals to cast their vote in elections or send us a reminder of a friend's birthday or prompt the diabetic to take their next insulin dose. Primarily, however, and perhaps more problematically, it has been used to manipulate users, emotions and desires for commercial or political gain. By a James K.A. Smith, I argue that such technology becomes liturgical when used to direct or manipulate individuals towards certain ultimate ends, whether religious or secular. And my contention is that while it's not all persuasive technology is liturgical, there are applications that aim at deep-seated hopes and desires. Conversely, in some sense, all liturgical artifacts, 
are forms of persuasive technology that direct worshippers towards ultimate ends. Christian liturgy is effectively mediated practices that use media technology, broadly defined, to orientate worshippers towards God. As such, liturgical objects has been, can be seen as persuasive technology in that they seek to direct the individual or group to behave and think in certain ways. Arguably, the digital application of persuasive technology is particularly potent for liturgical formation as it can be utilized, it can utilize machine learning to precisely and repeatedly shape individuals through emotional triggers. And this is something that we've uh, seen uh, been put to use uh, quite regularly uh, and sometimes scary ways in recent years for in terms of political for political purposes. As churches familiarize themselves with the logic of the medium, they've already begun to understand the tools available to keep worshippers engaged in online worship. Liturgy as persuasive technology is a lens which crystallizes the issues at stake. They argue that as a framework, it highlights some important questions and considerations that churches need to reflect on when developing online liturgies. As a first, a first merit is that it encourages the exploration of the creation and innovation of liturgical practice uh, in online spaces, as well as the use of digital, digital application in on-site uh, places of worship. And here, authenticity and integrity of such liturgical innovation depend on the semblance of its continuity with Christian traditions, symbols, and rituals. A second merit of the liturgy as persuasive technology framework is that it elucidates the formative power of mediated worship. It invites us to investigate how technology and the design of digital platform acts liturgically upon us and to what ends. And finally, it is precisely because lit liturgy is powerful that it does raise important ethical questions. If we agree that liturgy can be seen as persuasive technology, it is arguably all, it, this always includes power dynamics and an element of manipulation, or at least the dangers thereof. And because of the efficiency of digital technology, we rightfully need to discuss the limits of persuasive technology and its use in worship. So that's kind of roughly uh, a rough summary of my chapter. Thank you.